See how leaves build at the fences and years or trees equally come to be believed. No one will speak of this unless we speak. That was Tony Lopez in 1985 in my first anthology, Angels of Fire. Um, And those words, that's actually the last poem in the book, and those words, again, seem very prescient and perfective for us now. So we all know this is a moment in time. We all know this is a crisis. We all know this is an opportunity. We all know, do we not, the writing is on the wall. And with recent events, we know also, I think, that outcomes are not fixed or guaranteed and that things can change. And it's as important that we know that than we know what is overt and, well, obvious in that sense. Thinking about this today, our crisis is now the environment understood in so many ways, including the human environment, I think, more and more, the NHS, for example. It's not separate, and that must affect how we think about ecology and conservation. We are not different in this way from the Earth and from the cosmos, except that it bothers us. It bothers us. But we can turn for guidance to the wonderful 13th century mystic, Ibn Arabi, who, who talks about this. And he says, this is the place. He talks about the place where, as he describes it, the two seas meet, the sweet and the bitter. This is the meeting of the sun and of the shadow. And he talks about it in the context of the story of Moses, who goes on a journey in search of enlightenment. And Moses is called back by his servant to say, you know, oh, we forgot our fish, the dead fish that they'd been carrying around for their lunch. So they go back, and suddenly they find the dead fish has come alive again and leapt off into the ocean. And Moses says, this is the place. This is the place where the two seas meet. And at that place where the two seas meet, the darkness and the light, that is where Chide appears. Chide is the green man. Chide is um, the life force. Chide is the force of transformation. So all is not lost for us. We are here at this point of, of the lying together of darkness and light. And this can be our place for transformation where we might evolve into something better. Thank you so much, Jenny, for that inspiring opening to the day. My name is Giles Goddard. I'm the vicar of this church, and it's very, very good to be able to welcome you all all here. It's been a delight to work with Jay in the preparation of this day. Just before my meditation, just to say a little bit about St. John's, um, I kind of like to think that that we're more than just a church, or rather we're kind of what a church ought to be because churches ought to be seeking out and trying to refresh the whole human being, the spiritual and the reflective side, as well as the active side. I take the environment very seriously. I'm a member of the Church of England's Environment Working Group, trying to get the C of E to take all this more seriously. It's good to see Sue here. So we are here an eco-church. We um, we actually got a silver award in the eco-church process, so very pleased with that. And we're in the process of um, becoming even more environmental as we redevelop the whole building. The wave on the ocean. Each wave has its own uniqueness, its own fingerprint, its own vibration, if you like. And yet the wave is never separate from the ocean. That's the same for all of the vibrations in our bodies. All of us here are immersed in this ocean of being. 
And the more we allow ourselves to open up to it, again, neuroscience gives us many clues to aligning our left and right brain hemispheres, our head, heart and guts, our sympathetic and parasympathetic networks, an eco-poetic way of being in the world, to use Jay's expression. The more we tend towards harmony inside ourselves and we bring in wisdom and compassion in the way in which we engage with the world. And so in answer to the question, can poetry save the world, I would put forward that a poetic way of being in the world is the ground from which any worldview that seeks harmony with nature is rooted. And why would we seek anything less as homo sapiens, as wise beings? Hear, and your soul shall sing, says the book of Isaiah. Learn how to see and realize everything connects with everything else, says the great da Vinci. Look deep, deep, deep into nature and you will understand everything better, says Albert Einstein. He went on to say that the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational mind its faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. It did not begin slowly, neither was I born into awakening. We lay down in the shining dust, disturbed bright in the hay of our days. Love ran unweighed, leaving echoes and scent in empty rooms before summer and ice were named. Look again. The gulls asleep in the air over a sea, hushed with rain, are not enduring sadness. There is nectar from the bitter stem. The finch's nest is wound in thorns. Reason is the scorn of love, and sorrow will sweep your house clean. Thank you. Uh, we can uh, enjoy this lovely green space for a moment. Millennium Park. Uh, pause to give you one of my my own uh, ideas of Blake and Rambo uh, in the word millennium. I see them as um, characters who are participants in a great uh, tradition, as described by Norman Cohen in his book Pursuit of the Millennium. Uh, its subtitle was revolutionary millenarians and mystical anarchists of the Middle Ages. <laughs> so it described all kinds of groups like the Free Spirit and the, the Amorians, the Ranters and so on. Uh, and I see Blake and Rambo very much in that tradition, individualist anarchists perhaps, and very, very gifted artists. But I do see that revolutionary millenarianism in their work. Uh, and mystical anarchism seems to be a very good way of describing them. Uh, Peter Marshall calls Blake visionary anarchist in a short study. Um, uh, and I see four bears. I see Abizer Kopp, who used to preach around Southwark. His, his uh, fiery flying rolls remind me of, uh, of Blake's Marriage of Heaven and Hell and Arthur Rimbaud's A Season in Hell. Uh, and I even see Ginsburg's Howl as a later uh, version, sort of a, whereby a Russian emigrate Jew takes it to you know, the new land of America, the spirit's still going. Good to eat a thousand years is the last phrase of the opening section of How. That, that thousand is always a little obvious millenarian clue. The, the millen millenarians believe that in, in the Middle Ages that the new Jerusalem would appear in the sky, it would slowly descend on earth, the, the righteous, that's us lot, would party for a thousand years on earth with Jesus, and then we would all ascend for the after party, which would go on forever. That was the, that was the idea. I'm in. Um, I'm going to say, put my name down. <laughs> definitely optimistic, weren't they? Yeah, very optimistic. So, it's, and New Jerusalem is, is key. So, imagining cities, the Golganuza uh, is part of that. Here's, a, here's 
Rimbaud mentioning the word thousand, this is probably a description of London, from, uh, from the farewell to a season in hell. Autumn, our boat risen through the moveless fogs, turns towards misery's port, an enormous city whose sky is stained with fire and mud. Ah, the rotting rags, rain-soaked bread, drunkenness, a thousand crucifying loves. This ghoulish queen will never relent, queen of millions of dead souls and bodies that will be judged. And there I see myself again, skin eaten away by mud and plague, my hair full of worms, my armpits too, and my heart full of fatter worms, just lying there beside ageless, loveless unknowns. I could have died there. Unbearable. I hate poverty. So it's uh, turned upside down there. We get the we get this rather than Jerusalem. That seems to be he's just come back from London and the terrible trauma of Brussels as well. In Blake's time, his local was there and it was called the pineapple. It's been modernized, but Blake would have a pint at the pineapple. But only one time he was he sat down outside some pub, could have been the pineapple. He was tired, he was carrying copper plates. Suddenly the angel Gabriel appeared. Blake, get up, get up and rise. You don't, mustn't rest yet. Carry on, Blake, carry on. And it became a symbol for him. It was like halfway through his life. Maybe he's beginning to tire. But the angel said, no, you must carry on. I hope he finishes pint then. <laughs> so there's a convention on biological diversity, which is a global framework. And in 2020, China will host that. And that is a really important meeting where I believe the Chinese, with their current ecological civilization policy, will want to show leadership in looking after nature in the same way they are currently showing leadership in trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions while the United States, for the moment anyway, is um, going in a different direction. So this, that's one convention, the Climate Convention, Paris Agreement, people have heard a lot about in the news. And trying to pull all of those things together, it's really saying, so what are the three pillars of sustainable development? Economic, which tends to be the driver. Social, and how do we include the poor people many of whom have shown their distress in this country with recent votes and an economic system that is not supporting them. So that's the second pillar, the social. And the third, which is an even quieter voice, is the environment. So economic, social, and environmental are the three pillars of sustainable development. And I am committed to all three even though my main role is to shout or perhaps sing after today's workshop for the environment. So I chose a poem which was the first poem I learnt at school. So Jay said that would be okay. Sorry, you have to understand, I am a scientist. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? That takes me to the, the other hat that I've got on today as, as uh, um, uh, a publisher of a small press called Arwen Publications. And we, are, we have published a manifesto called An Ecobardic Manifesto, A Vision for the Arts in a Time of Environmental Crisis. And um, the, 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 this is a, our mission statement, if you'd like, for us as a publisher, but it's also intended to be a provocation to other artists to, to do exactly the sort of thing that Glenn was pointing to at the end of his talk, for the arts to, to make a difference. And um, I, I think there's a, 
uh, there can be a tension between the, the, the desire to use the arts instrumentally to, to make a difference and for art to be art, to be truly art. Because the danger, of course, is that art becomes propaganda and it ceases to be art. So, I'm Jane Samuels and I've got a couple hats on too. I, um, I work international as international consultant um, all over 20 different countries. Development, slum upgrading, um, war -torn, rebuilding war-torn countries. And this sort of work, I'm now on the governing board of an organization called the Commonwealth Human Ecology Council. And from that, it's quite exciting because having had this years of experience on ground and country level projects, this, in this position, you can get right to the head of governments, of 50 of them, <laughs> instantly, just because of the nature of our accredited organization. So I was able to use this um, uh, two years ago at the last heads of state, heads of government, Chogum in Malta, where we had an opportunity to look at food security and the pollinators. And this was just before the Intergovernmental Panel of Ecosystems and Biodiversity actually did their first report on pollinators. So we had a chance to work with some, some of the leading people, experts and so on, and we put together this report. And we were able to kind of launch this at this event and get this report to the heads of government all of them and it's quite an exciting position to be in and to create these dialogues and then now we're actually implementing how do you actually implement these projects how do you roll them out and how do you you know get in people and in particularly youth um, I was very fortunate to help set up the first UN Youth Envoy Office it took us several years working with a particular government of Norway but it was a huge effort and so I have a invest, vested interest in young people and they're taking part in these events and youth-led development. It's the first time I used a tube in a very long time and they kept saying mind the gap <laughs> and I think that in all my work and all my writing what I'm trying to do is mind the gap between what we want and what we dream and what we have dreamed and what is happening to our dream. So I am trying to write things that go right for the gap. And I'm just going to read a piece today that's called The Bill of Truth because I think one of our new gaps that is opened up is between truth and lie, what is fake, what is real. And I believe these could undermine all of our efforts to inspire people to come together at this time. So I'm going to read to you what I've written. It's called The Bill of Truth. We, the people, without exception, declare these truths to be self-evident. Planet Earth is our home, and we do not wish it to be destroyed by the greed of 1% of us. We wish to survive climate change as a global community. Profiteering from our extinction is unacceptable to us. Education must not be used as a tool to create slaves for the system. All education systems are failing our children in present time since they are failing to mention that our collective way of life is destroying their future by the second. We do not wish to follow the Armageddon script and use nuclear or other weapons of mass destruction against each other. We are all of one body and of one spirit. Thusly, we live by the law of love, doing unto all others as we would have done unto ourselves, since anything less is the spirit of empire. We do not want our food to be poisoned nor rendered too expensive for the poor if it has goodness in it. We wish to feed the hungry, not watch them die. We desire to save our souls from spiritual ignorance and to evolve into a deeper understanding of ourselves and our Maker, free from ideas about reality and God that do nothing but harm us. We recognise that we have infinite potential as yet to be manifest as we choose. There is no fate of what we make. We recognise that because we are all one, 
If one of us is poor, we are all poor. We cannot live in peace separated from our brothers and sisters by walls everywhere we look. Um, I wanted to say that one of the important subtexts of this invitation to engage, which takes place in two parts, part one is the panel, part two is a direct poetic and musical invitation to engage, which will follow this panel. Okay? Um, but I actually found myself thinking in terms of publishers and publishing, and Anthony has, has spoken to that, one of the important questions is, what are we publishing today and why? Yeah. And I actually invited three major poetry publishers to be present at this discussion. One is on an overseas trip, so I'll give him that. Um, but the other two, who I read to personally, didn't even respond to my letter. And these are so-called major publishers. And it seems important that you know that, because the invitation to engage, it seems as if there is no engagement. So I found myself thinking, and in talking to my dear friend Martin Palmer, without whom this day would also not be taking place, Martin was saying, well, if they're not getting it, as it seems that they're not, what are we to do in that situation? And that seems to be a very valid question to be thinking about with, with those of us here. So that's a question I also wanted to reflect back to you, obviously, on our panel. But also, I'd like to hear from anyone in the audience who would like to respond to and then Sarah said something about coming up from Cornwall. I came up from Cornwall this morning <laughs> on an extremely crowded train full of holiday makers, but through ravishing countryside. So immediately we've never met, but you know, suddenly there's a connection. So I'd really just like to say that poetry is specific, poets are specific, we're some things, we're other things. We're not a huge collective, we neither are publishers, not all the commercial ones are evil and the indies are good. I mean, we're, we're, we're an absolute network of really minute connections. So I, I'd really like to say the word tiger and that happy person <laughs> in China. That just makes sense to me. Thank you. I think that's such an important point you raise. Thank you so much that it's personalising it in the way you have. And that's actually what's alive for all of us here. So thank you so much for bringing that forward. It's really valuable. A sudden boggy plummet, and I slide, notebook flapping, into mud and sudden white. The grounds are wedding. Hollyflowers sing in spider's web strings. Ahead, the bridge is smothered. And I remember today's my wedding anniversary. Nine years ago, we hitched beneath the ash tree in my neighbour's paddock because this is Sussex and that's how we do it. Now a woodpecker yaffles his congratulations. The streams hymning. The water prays, sinking through the hill. And my congregations made of clumps of grasses, marsh and crawling beetles. Oh bird choir, oh holly flower, oh cuckoo, oh mud and sandstone. Another aeroplane hums, I'm nine years home. One more poem, a welcome, which I created for a poetry gatherings, particularly in the winter, uh, but to gather all the realms of nature into the community. A welcome. To this hearth which is a heart, welcome. Welcome to our hearts. Welcome to our breath, seeking to be sung. May those without a place find welcome here. May those without a tongue be brought to utterance. Welcome to the stone that has no mouth to cry with. Welcome to the leaf that trembles on the edge of speaking. Welcome to the owl's high lonely questioning. May our ears catch answers. 
May the word which hovers above our heads find hospitality. May the song which crosses between the living and the dead be part of what we sing. Welcome to the fabulous names of things. Glory be to Gaia. Glory be to Gaia for rainbows, glaciers, and fresh snow. We honor and praise you, Gaia, mysterious blue planet, unique in this vast universe. Like your widest rivers, our hearts flow with gratitude. Glory be to Gaia, for forests, valleys, and exquisite flowers. We honor and praise you, Gaia, great mother. Thank you for clean air and water, and all the fruits and seeds manifest through your abundant power. Glory be to Gaia for birdsong, mountains, and clear lakes. We honor and praise you, Gaia, giant, pulsating orb of life from which we've grown. Please help us find our interdependence with all animal and human kin. Glory be to Gaia for millipedes, worms, and all tiny creatures. We honor and praise you, Gaia, ceaseless wheel of life. We embrace your eternal cycle, the rich soil our bodies will become, and the gift this present moment is. Glory be to Gaia, for whales, phosphorescence, and fish. We honor and praise you, Gaia, planet jewel of the cosmos, sacred being infused in our DNA. Please light the spark of peace in us, that we may serve this precious life. Babylon, a neoliberal theodicy, a modern adaption of the 1000 BCE poem by Sagil Kinam Ubib. One, Urset Latari. The ideological parents are dead. The ideological parents are stored in money vaults. No professors. No commentators change anything, do they? Illiquidity reigns. The orphans of neoliberalism, children who cannot understand what mathematics mathematicians do to them, cry privatizedly from the Switzerland of no return, sequestered in Babylon. Two, Huber. Clay proletariat, the dark visage scowls at light. Clay precariat, fallen or pushed to compete, are not all leveraged. All cross the Thames Hudson, the rich swim death. Pray save to the goddess Randa. Pray save to the god Hayeku, to gods of Babylon. The black country night of the present time goes clinking with silver down the land small cries of newborn life and the constellations in the rocking dark of late August dog days when the near star rages 
Nisus goes howling. For the body of the summer, lately slain. In rising winds, his golden torso broken. These early signs of death in the year and loss, the escaping quality of life, show more brutally the small divisions, ownership and loneliness everywhere here. The year falls stumbling down. Old hobo, landless traveller across the earth. Mendicant time, who wears tattered clothes, whose hair is matted and thick with experience. And the last country night of the royal stars sighs in a long black avenue of limes, pines for the outcast in deepening obscurity, who runs in his exodus westward. Once green messiah of the bells and horns, hat full of rainbows and coloured twilights, crowned king of imperious summer, gone. This age of darkness, ness, ness, ness. Age of toil and strife, of services unrendered, and of truth denied. Age of destruction, cataclysms and wars, age of great hunger and of hate which gnaws. Age when we fear to welcome in our sun. Age when air chokes and rivers cease to run. Age when trees die, denuded of green life. Age when food poisons and the soil deals death to life. Age of confusion. Age of misused sound, dissonant age, which now breaks up our ground. I'll praise this age. Forge after R.S. Thomas. How close do you feel to God? asks the priest. As I sit with my back to the altar, God answers for me, throws open the locked door of my heart, turns the heavy ring of the handle, lifts the stiff catch, takes away my breath on the swing of smooth hinges, lets in the air that is everywhere. God isn't arriving nor leaving through this four-chambered porch under my ribs. He is the opening and the door, the push and pulse of whatever moves through me, the whole red messiness of love. We do not know how these ancient aliens, once of the blessed, will fare. Shall we hold ourselves close and closed, separate, safe, among our cliffs and inlets, yet vulnerable, as we must be, to the blustering winds and the currents of change. Or open, open to the unknown, unknowable, coming at us on swirling wings, feathered, clawed, and on fire, out of the ashes of the comfortably familiar? Shall we welcome the multifaceted humanity? reaching through the violence to a new white sanity, to peace. <laughs>
If you can dream and make your dream your teacher. If you can think and keep your thinking clear. If you can meet with any living creature and treat them with respect and hold them dear. If you can speak the truth in spite of rumor. If you can see the fear through the spin. If you can keep your patience and good humor when those around you buckle and give in. If you can set aside the need for winning, or who is in control and who is boss, and in yourself create a new beginning where suffering is everybody's loss. If you can honor air and soil and water and love the living land you walk upon. If you can show your son and teach your daughter to do the same long after you are gone. If you can know yourself to be the equal of anybody you have ever met. If you can know your story has a sequel, more beautiful, that isn't written yet. If you can fill the day and month and season with true and ever clearer ways of seeing. Yours is the earth by love and rhyme and reason and which is more, you'll be a human being.